and for more on biodiversity. Earlier, my colleague Rochelle Kufo spoke with Nepal Ash. She's the director of the United Nations Environment Program's World Conservation Monitoring Center. Rochelle began by asking for a breakdown of how important the COP15 conference that's underway in China is. Well, COP15 is a UN summit on biodiversity. And in fact, this time around, it's being convened in two parts. So the first part this week, and the second part will take place in May, April and May next year. And the overall theme for COP is in the context of ecological civilization, but its ambition is to agree a new plan for nature. So a global framework to determine priorities needed to address the loss of biodiversity, to ensure the benefits that biodiversity provides are sustained, and to ensure that the means to deliver on this ambition are available. And at its heart, COP15 is an agenda about people. We all depend on biodiversity, nature for our food, a healthy environment, the clothes we wear, and many of our livelihoods. And nature is ultimately the foundation of our economies and societies, including through underpinning around half of global GDP. So this is an agenda about people. It's also an agenda about climate change and connecting what's happening in Kunming in COP15 to what's happening in COP26 on climate change in Glasgow. So addressing biodiversity loss is critical if we're going to tackle climate change. And around one third of the solutions to climate mitigation are found in environmental management, managing forests, managing wetlands, managing agricultural systems to reduce emissions, but also making use of biodiversity to help adapt to climate change. So the connections between the climate agenda and the biodiversity agenda are also very, very strong. So then obviously this first part, as you mentioned, is taking part in Kunming. Talk about China's role in these discussions on biodiversity. Well, China is hosting the world both virtually this week and in person at the second part of the conference in, in April and May next year. But most importantly, China is providing political leadership as president of the COP. It's supporting achieving consensus uh, in, on the negotiations over the coming months, and but also demonstrating leadership on the actions which are necessary to deliver on the implementation of what's agreed at the conference. So leadership both for the negotiation process, but also leadership for delivering on its outcomes. So the role of China, the leadership role of China is critical in that context. And do we have any expectations as to what we might expect in President Xi's address on Tuesday, especially given the white paper on biodiversity that just came out on Friday? Well, it's essential to have leadership from all heads of state and, and to establish a commitment for action across the whole of government. And, and I'm sure we'll hear uh, much about this from, from the president when he addresses the high level session uh, tomorrow. But biodiversity needs to be addressed across the whole of government. And that's why we need head of state engagement. So uh, commitments to address in, in, in the trade agenda, in agriculture, in finance and in development planning. And of course, China has much to demonstrate in these areas. So on the restoration agenda, for example, tremendous progress being made in, in China with the forest area increasing by over 25% in the last 20 years. China has been doing great work on mainstreaming biodiversity across sectors of government. So through the approach of ecological civilization, reaching all parts of government and society and the protection of nature in the 14th five-year plan. So there's much to demonstrate in China. I'm sure the president will talk to some of these lessons learned, as well as ambitions for the future. And as you mentioned, this is something that should be sort of woven through all these things as they affect things like trade and agriculture versus a sort of add-on and an afterthought. So talk about how the world in general has done in terms of reaching the goals that were laid out from 2011 to, 2000, to 2020. Well, the world fell short. We made insufficient progress towards many of the ambitions we set out for 2020. And in fact, we didn't meet any of the targets and goals in full. Meaningful progress is only made on around 30% of these ambitions. So, for example, we did meet a target to um, protect 17% of the global land area. But even there, we didn't make progress on making sure that protection was sufficient in quality. So we need to focus on other areas. We need to focus on addressing the underlying drivers of biodiversity loss, sustainable consumption and production, food systems, finance systems. And here systemic changes are needed. And this requires mainstreaming, bringing biodiversity to bear across the whole of government. It really is not a job for environment ministries alone. But we also need to make sure the political will is there and the resources are there for delivering on the ambitious targets. So there's much that needs to be done in the next 10 years that we didn't manage to deliver in the last 10 years. So action to date is really not matched ambition at a global scale, and that must change if we are to secure a future where we live in harmony with nature. 